I'm going to read. You, I want you to turn to Luke chapter four, and I am going to read uh, a, just parts of a couple of stories in the Old Testament. We're not going to go back there and, and read them, but Jesus refers to these in the passage we're going to look at. I'm going to read a little bit from First Kings chapter seventeen, and then I'll go to Second Kings chapter five. But uh, in First Kings chapter seventeen, God tells Elijah to go to a widow who lives at, uh, at Zarephath, which is close to the to the um, coastal city of Zidon. And uh, he tells Elijah to go there because this widow will uh, feed him. He says in verse number 9, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. And so he goes to this widow woman, and this is where we find the miracle that God performs as uh, this lady has some oil and she has some um, uh, meal. And she's, she was going to feed her son and her and they were going to die, she said. <laughs> and uh, Elijah came and this is what God did. Uh, verse number 15, And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days, and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. So as long as they needed food, she had the meal and the oil, and, and it, she kept pouring out oil, and it kept coming. And she kept bringing, even if she used it all up, it was, there was more there the next day, just like the manna would come every day for the children of Israel. Uh, so that was the widow woman. And then in 2 Kings chapter 5, we find Naaman, uh, the, the story of Naaman, who comes from Syria uh, to Elisha. And uh, uh, he is, he's coming because his uh, wife's servant girl said there's a prophet in Israel who can heal uh, Naaman. And, of course, we know it's not Elisha that, that heals Naaman. It's God who heals him. Uh, this is the first verse says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. So he had this, this disease, and he, he was sent, or he went to Elisha uh, to be healed. And this is what Elisha does. Um, it says, uh, verse number 9, So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Of course, Naaman thought, that, that, That's crazy. Uh, I got rivers in, in Syria, and I can go wash in those. And his servants told him, Listen, if, he, if Elisha told you some great thing to do, you would have done it, right? Well, probably. But, and so this is really simple, and that's all he said to do. And so they got him to go down. And it says uh, in verse number 14, Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So we have those two uh, miracles that were por performed by God through Elijah and Elisha. Now in Luke chapter 4, I closed my Bible right there at Luke chapter 4. Um, Jesus is in his hometown of Nazareth. Luke, I said, Luke chapter 4, verse number 15. And it says, And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had hope, opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Then he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath appointed me, anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled, 
in your ears. And all bare him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Eliseus the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. So we see Jesus reading out of the scriptures and pointing out that he has, he has arrived, the Messiah has arrived, and he is fulfilling that passage. And that's what he says. This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He's saying, I am the Messiah. And that's uh, pretty serious. They're looking at him, and, and all they see is, is Joseph's son, Mary's son. And we'll, we'll look at uh, Matthew. Well, let's just go ahead and look at it right now. Go to Matthew chapter 13. He's so familiar to the people. He grew up there. They saw him. They've seen him as an adult. He didn't start his ministry till he was uh, around 30 years old. And so he's grown up into a man, and they they watched him grow up. Uh, Matthew 13, look at verse number 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? This is the same account. Uh, is not his mother called Mary, and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then has this man all these things? Um, they have heard, these people uh, in Nazareth have heard that there's this man, and maybe they've heard it, it was Jesus of Nazareth, we don't know. But they have heard about all the miracles, the healings that Jesus had, had performed in Capernaum and other places. And now he's there, and uh, he's saying to them, I am the Christ, basically. In his hometown, they listened and they were amazed at what he what he uh, said. Uh, but what what he's saying to them doesn't make a whole lot of sense because to them, he's just a local boy. And I don't know if you you probably haven't been. Maybe somebody has. I we I grew up pretty much in a in one church and brought my girlfriend to church. She's in here now, but not this church. But uh, uh, we uh, we got married, but people seem to still treat us as kids. And uh, um, that's a hard thing. You, you grow up and you want to be treated like an adult. And here these people are seeing Jesus, and he's 30 years old. But they still treat him like he's just a normal person. But this is Christ. This is God in the flesh. And he, they say to him, or he said, this is what he said. He says, you will say to me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. He's, he's telling them, you want to see all the miracles. You want me to do the miracles. What he's telling them is the problem is, and he's not, he doesn't say it in these words, the problem is, I will do the miracles and you still won't believe. I can show you all the things that I've done in other towns but it's not going to make a difference to you. Um, they didn't see. They're, they're in a, a different town from Capernaum and other places where Jesus has already ministered. And it's not like uh, somebody can broadcast it through a television showing you. Of course, you, you don't know what's on TV anymore. Or on, you watch uh, all kinds of videos and they're so, they can do so many things with videos. You don't know what's real and what's not. But uh, they couldn't even do that from a distance. They had to wait till the miracles were performed in their land. 
but he couldn't do very many because they weren't going to believe him because he's not, he says they're not, uh, uh, a person is not um, accepted in his own country. Go over to uh, Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, Peter points out that Jesus is this person who is going around um, doing good and healing people. He's talking to uh, Cornelius in verse number 38. It says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So these people in Nazareth, they hadn't, they, they've heard about a person, but they haven't seen him. They don't know that this is him, and uh, this is the Christ. And when Jesus says he is the Christ, then there's the, the, the fact that they want to see a sign. And uh, Jesus wasn't going to show them a sign. Go over to um, John chapter 2. Well, it's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul makes a statement there in 1 Corinthians that the Jews want to see a sign. Verse number 22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. It's interesting that, that Paul makes that uh, observation of the Jewish people. The Jews require a sign. For what? What are the Jews going to do with a sign or a miracle? Well, what did they do with the miracles in the Old Testament? They forgot about them. But that's what they want to see. They want to see something miraculous. Um, go over to John chapter 2. John chapter 2 and verse number 18. So Jesus uh, just got through cleaning the temple, ca casting out the money changers, throwing over the tables, chasing out the animals. And this is what people say, the, the Jews said to him, verse number 18, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? So you show us that you have the authority to do this. What kind of sign do you show us? And what does he tell them? He says, Destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. Of course, he was standing by the temple and they misunderstood him. He's talking about his body. He says, destroy this. Three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. And that's a pretty good sign. But uh, they didn't believe him. They wanted a sign. Go over to Matthew chapter 12. Jesus makes it clear what kind of people want to see a sign. What he says to them we take at face value, but going deeper, if they get the sign, are they going to do something with it? Look at verse number 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees <laughs> answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Three days and three nights in the whale's belly. What does he say? He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. So that's what he said. So what did he just do? He, yeah, he told them what the sign would be. But he told them that they are an evil and adulterous generation. Right? Because they require a sign. Now, if they get the sign, are they going to stop being evil and adulterous? No. So the signs, the miracles, are not what prompts faith. Faith uh, it comes through hearing, the Bible says, and hearing by the Word of God. Remember this, the, the account that Jesus uh, told about the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man and uh, the crippled man, Lazarus, they both died. And the rich man went to hell and he lifted up his eyes in torment and uh, called out to Abraham. And he, he's, uh, Abraham, Abraham said, uh, 
Uh, you can't come this way and we can't go there. It's, there's a gulf, great gulf between us. But uh, the, so the rich man said, well, then send Lazarus from the dead to go to my brothers so that they don't come to this horrendous place. And what did Abraham say? I'll read it. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Wow. And, and he's not just talking about Lazarus there. He's talking about himself. Even though I am raised from the dead, people are still not going to believe. They might even see me. How many people saw Jesus and never believed after he was risen from the dead? We don't know. But not everybody recognizes the truth when they see it. Go over to Romans chapter 8. Miracles are not used by God to bring about salvation or faith. He doesn't need miracles. You know, the, the Bible is, is full of miracles in the New Testament, and it was to authenticate the message of the people who performed the miracles. We have the Scripture now, and we don't need miracles. We need to hear the Word of God. Look at Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 24. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? What, is the, what does Hebrews say? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. How are people saved? By seeing? By miracles? No, by faith. And faith is not seen. And so the miracles Jesus could have performed there would have made no difference to those people. They would have seen it and they say, okay, some sort of trick he must be doing, but it's not going to bring about faith. So Jesus says, a prophet is not honored in his own country. You, you're an evil, basically, he didn't say it to them at that time, but he's saying you're an evil and adulterous generation if you want to see a sign. And beside that, I could do all kinds of things, I could teach you all kinds of things, but I'm not going to be accepted in my own country because prophets aren't. How many times did prophets go to Israel? And that's why he gave those two examples. That Elijah and Elisha, there were a lot of widows in, in Israel when Elijah was the prophet. But God sent him outside the country. Elisha uh, was in the midst of the country with a lot of lepers too. But he healed a man who was from another country. Why? Because the people of his country, most of them were already turned away from God. And uh, Jesus is basically saying, <laughs> I could be wasting my time doing these miracles with you, to, for you. Um, go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah was uh, a prophet during the very end of the, uh, uh, the nation of Israel being a, being a nation, Israel and, and Judah. And it was at the end of Judah's uh, kingdom. Israel was already overtaken by Assyria. Jeremiah is in, uh, is in Judah, and he is God's prophet. Now I want you to see what... Uh, Jeremiah didn't have... Uh, he didn't have many converts in his uh, uh, ministry, or any or maybe none, but uh, he did what God wanted him to do. He preached what God wanted him to preach. Look at Jeremiah 42, and he's bringing a message. He's going to bring a message to uh, the people of Judah. And this is what, what uh, they tell him. They, they, they're telling the people of Judah, saying, Jeremiah, we want you to go to God, and we want you to hear the message from God, and then come back and tell us. Look at verse 5. Then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us, if we do not even according to all things for the which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Okay, so we, he says, um, they said, God is a true witness. 
but it's bad for us if we don't do what he says. Look at verse 6. He says, they say, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will what? Obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. Sounds good, doesn't it? Go find out what God says. You come back with his message and we'll do it. Okay? So Jeremiah uh, leaves them and goes and talks with God and God talks with him. And God gives him a message. Look at verse uh, chapter 43 and look at verse number 1. And it came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people all the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them, even all these words, then spake Azariah the son of Hoshiah, and Johanna the son of Kareah, and all the proud men, saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. You, Jeremiah, you're telling us false. You're telling us a lie. We know God's, it's okay with God for us to go into Egypt. No, it wasn't. God says, if you go into Egypt and you don't buckle under and you don't put yourself under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to die you know, one way or another. And that's what Jeremiah brought to them. But here's Jeremiah speaking to his own people. And instead of listening to God through Jeremiah, they said, Jeremiah, you're a liar. And that's why we have the book of Lamentations. <laughs> Jeremiah crying over his nation because nobody believed him. A prophet in his own country. And that's what Jesus pointed out. Remember Jesus when he came to the world? What does it say in John 1? He came unto his own and what? His own received him not. The reason Jesus spoke to the people this way and told them all these things about themselves, He wanted to point out to them, listen, God's not going to put up with irreligious behavior. God's not going to waste His time trying to pull you into His kingdom. Now God's got all the time. God created time but the point is, each one of us have so much time. And God is not going to waste time when He reaches people, when He tells people what they need. At some point, He stops working in people's lives. The Bible says in Proverbs, um, the, being often rebuked, a man will harden his neck. And he'll suddenly be destroyed without remedy. Because there's a time... God will work in people. He will work with people. He will tell them what they need. But at some point, if they keep rejecting, then He stops. Wow. That's a scary thought that God is going to do that. Uh, look over at Genesis chapter 6. Who knows what's in Genesis chapter 6 without looking? Oh, and the flood, right? Sometimes we say our streets are flooded. <laughs> That's not a flood. <laughs> this is a flood. Genesis chapter 6, look what God says. Verse number 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Not because Noah was righteous, but because God had grace on him, had mercy on him. But he says, the man, man how, how many years from, from creation? We're here, Genesis chapter 6. How many years from creation did God look at this and say, man is corrupt. Corrupt to the point that I need to destroy them. Anybody know? Approximately? Maybe 2,000 years from when God created man. 2,000 years. How long has it been since Jesus was crucified? 2,000 or so years. Do you think we're better than the people of God's, of Noah's time? No. 
man gets worse and worse. God finally gives up on people. Look over at 2 Chronicles 36. As you're turning there, think about Pharaoh. As uh, God dealt with Pharaoh, kept giving him the opportunities to turn and let the people go, and Pharaoh wouldn't do it until finally he went too far and went too far <laughs> to more than the one, too far under the, into the Red Sea and too far in God's, uh, God's wrath. God destroyed him and his army. Second Chronicles 36, look at verse number 15. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Jesus is telling the people, you must believe. I'm not going to show you a miracle. You're just going to have to have faith. You're going to have to believe that I am the, the Christ. Look at uh, Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, we have a man coming to Jesus. Now, I'm not going to read the part about the, the woman of uh, uh, Canaan, the Syrophoenician woman, where the woman comes to him and says that I, my daughter is, is uh, demon-possessed or, or sick. And he said, I am come to the children of Israel, the lost sheep of Israel. But he does heal her daughter. And here we find a centurion coming to Jesus. Genesis, uh, Luke chapter 7. Now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. So this centurion was not a Jew. Jesus healed this centurion's servant because of God's heart. Verse number 9. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, listen, listen carefully. He says, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Did this man see the miracle? Did he see what, uh, what Jesus did for his servant? No. Jesus, he told the man, told Jesus, uh, don't come under my roof. You know, he says, I know. Well, I say, I say this. I, he knows Jesus is on a mission. Okay? And Jesus' mission is to the Jewish people. The centurion, I believe, recognizes that. And what he tells Jesus, he says, I'm under, I'm under authority. I also have people under me. And what I tell them to do, they're supposed to do. That's all he tells Jesus. And so Jesus says, I recognize faith here. Faith that he didn't see Jesus do any miracle, but he knows he can. And he believed that Jesus would heal him. And... Uh, the servant was healed. But again, these, these are people who are not Jews. Jesus ministered to them. Paul, as he ministered in the book of Acts, he ministered to his people, the Jewish people. Every city he went into, the first thing he did was go to a synagogue. And when they rejected him, he says, okay, I wipe my feet off this city and I'm going to go to the Gentiles. See, God works in people's hearts up to a point. And if people keep rejecting, continue to reject Him, uh, He stops working. There is no remedy. And it's no different today. God works on people. He prods them like He did to Saul of Tarsus. Pricks them, pokes them tries to get them to hear, tries to get them to 
uh, turn their heart around and receive Jesus Christ and they keep rejecting one day it'll be too late and God will stop it's very dangerous uh, to turn away from God's offer of salvation look over at Hebrews chapter 2 Now in this passage, as the writer is writing, he's, he's really he's talking to Christian uh, Jews, and what he says is, is to them, but it's just, it does apply to unsaved people also. Look at verse number, um, well, let's start at verse number one of chapter two. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? How shall we escape? How shall people escape if they neglect the salvation of God? The offer of salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. What's going to happen to people? because they reject Jesus Christ. Continue to reject. Reject, 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 until finally they have no opportunity to reject because God says, that's it. No more. You know, we might think that God doesn't do it very often. He probably doesn't. But people die every day. So if people die every day without Christ, who's stopping working in their heart? God is. And He doesn't give them an opportunity after they're dead. So we have the responsibility to give forth the gospel. And people will reject us, and they continue to reject us. And it might be that we feel like stopping. You know, as long as they have us to talk to them, and they finally say, don't ever talk to me again about this. All right, there we have to stop. But we have a responsibility to God to give the gospel, to preach the gospel. We're living in a dark world. The, we saw it this morning that the Satan is blinding the minds of the world, those without Christ. And he keeps them blinded. We are the light of the world to bring the truth of the gospel to those people uh, because things in their mind and hearts are so dark. We need to realize that they are unsaved. When they die, you know, it's it's easy, I think. Maybe it's just me. But it's easy to think that, uh, well, that's their problem. No, it's, it's, it's our responsibility to be the witnesses we should be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his ministry on earth to people. He shows us His love, His goodness toward others in healing, helping, reaching people with the truth that, that He was the Messiah. And Lord, help us because of our faith, because of our knowledge of what Jesus Christ has done. We have that responsibility to carry forth the truth that He brought into the world. Help us to be the witnesses uh, we should be. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.